welcome, welcome everybody uh, to the event tonight. Um, we have a, a great panel of people, uh, excited to have them all here. Uh, we were talking earlier in, in preparation for the start, and uh, I think the the biggest concern we had was that there wasn't going to be really adequate time to get through everything. So I hope you've blocked out the next six hours instead of 90 minutes uh, so that we can make a better attempt. But no, just just kidding. There is there is a tremendous amount that the, the film uh, brings out and covers if you've been able to see it. And uh, I... Um, I'm just honored that everyone uh, can be here tonight uh, to at least spend some time kind of delving into more about the film itself and, and what it has meant and what it means still today in relation to, to what the film covers. So uh, my name is Kai Hushka, by the way. I'm going to be moderating tonight. I am a member of the Oregon uh, Community Rights Network Board. Uh, I'm also an organizer for the Community Environmental Legal uh, Defense Fund. Uh, I live here in Spokane, Washington, uh, along uh, a tributary of the Spokane River called Hangman Creek. Uh, it's the traditional lands of the Spokane tribes, as well as frequented by the uh, tribes from the Palouse, the Coeur d'Alene, and, um, and other tribes that would congregate here for salmon fishing on an annual basis. Uh, we're going to meet our panelists here shortly. Uh, just want to really begin by saying thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, especially want to thank all the various uh, community rights organizations that help uh, put this event together, helped get the word out. Uh, that includes uh, Community Rights Lane County, uh, Lincoln County Community Rights, Community Rights Douglas County, uh, the Oregon Community Rights Network, uh, as well as the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, for doing all the hard work. A number of you here, here tonight that were part of the event committee and, uh, and doing your best to, to spread the word uh, both uh, for tonight's event, uh, but as well as for people to, to see the film. Um, and so hopefully we were successful in, uh, in getting the word out both for tonight's event as well as for, for people to have a chance to, to watch this uh, amazing uh, documentary. Uh, in, in so many ways. So again, thank you for, for being here. Uh, format wise tonight, we're, we're going to um, uh, ask questions of our panelists that we've, we've prepared, basically uh, have a chance for each of our panelists to, to talk about kind of their connection to the film, uh, the, the relevancy of, of why they're here uh, as, as panelists tonight. And then the last half of tonight's evening, we will open it up to you guys, the audience, to, to ask questions questions uh, to our panelists. So uh, the way we'd like you to do that is if you have a question at any point, if you want to drop it in chat. So if you've used Zoom before, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat function. Uh, if you drop your question into chat, we have people that will be monitoring those questions and collecting them. And so when we get to that portion of today's uh, uh, event, I will then get those questions and try to go through as many as we can before the, for the end of the evening. So again, feel free to do so at any point. Um, I was trying to think of what to say about, about the film and there, there is so much that can be said um, about its power, um, its importance. Um, and I, I started to think about it in the sense of, of how much work went into to do what one can within the confines of a film to, to record the history of, of what's transpired. And it, it, it dawned on me that it's, it's not history that's really in the past, but unfortunately in, in so many sad ways, you know, history that's still alive today. Uh, and on the flip side though, uh, the amazing amount of energy and spirit going into uh, the quest for justice really uh, that has continued um, beyond the the two women featured in uh, in the film, uh, and how that that legacy continues today, and and the importance of the work that continues, and and really the the role of which the film plays in in all that real life work that that continues due to all the the harm and tragedy that have uh, resulted in in the use of Agent Orange and just the bigger reality of of toxic chemicals and. Uh, the systemic reality of, of how those things come to be and, uh, and the difficulty it is for, for people really and, and the planet and nature and so on to really um, protect themselves. Uh, and so uh, 
this film clearly is not about talking about something in the distant past. It's it's really talking about something that's it's very poignant and relevant today. And I know many of you on the call, it's it's, it's it is very real. And so, um, you know, there are so many ways that we can go about talking about the film. Uh, the film itself is really as re as well as what it means. And so, hopefully, we'll get to that in the way that. Um, we have in the sense of who's on our panel here tonight. So beyond, of course, thanking everyone for being here and thanking the organizations, you know, huge thank you to all our panelists for, for taking the time to be with us. And so we would like for our panelists to, to just introduce yourselves to everyone here, and then we'll, we'll get into some questions that I've prepared. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll move into questions from you who have attended here tonight. And like I said, as, as things come up in your head or things that you already know you want to ask, just drop that into chat uh, and we'll, we'll move from there. So I'm just going to prompt each of you, our panelists, to introduce yourselves and then I'll prompt the next person and then we'll get through, through each of you. So we have six panelists here tonight. Uh, and I'd like for Alan, if you can start first and, and introduce yourself, um, that would be great. I'd, I'd appreciate that. And welcome. Uh, thank you, Kai, and it's great to meet you uh, at least visually through after so many emails. Uh, I'm Alan Adelson. I produced and directed the film with uh, my wife and uh, dearest uh, partner, Kate Taverna, who's sitting beside me. Um, uh, she edited the film as well. Um, I initiated work on it almost 10 years ago when uh, I was shown photographs of the terribly deformed uh, Agent Orange uh, child victims in Vietnam. And I thought if a complete exploration could be made uh, into how it happened, that these deformities occurred, if it turned out that it was the result of corporate decisions that society needed to know how that had happened and it might be the makings of a good documentary film. Kate Taverna, I've cut many, many films. We've co-directed other films, four of them now. And um, I'm anxious to hear what all these other people have to say. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Alan. Um, definitely we'll hear from more of you, from both of you a little bit later. Uh, Deb, can you please introduce yourself? I certainly can. Um, my name is Deborah Fant. I live in Lincoln County, Oregon, and um, I wanted to acknowledge the, and honor the people for whom this coastal land was home and rich in food source by river, sea, and forests, where our relatives flourished and thrived. The rivers that are here going out to the ocean in the Pacific now carry the tribal names of the people who lived here, the Sayusla, the Yahats, the Alsea, Yakan, and Tillamook, which were all part of the Salish tribes to the north. These were the ones who were here before contact with white people. And after 12, 27 small tribes from the Rogue River Valley were relocated to this area, they are now known as the Confederation of the Siletz Tribes and the Confederation of Grand Ronde. Um, I, in addition to living here on these lands and appreciating them, um, I've, I've been a registered nurse in the county for many, many moons, and I have a new job as an activist, and I'm part of Lincoln County Community Rights. Thanks, Deb. Uh, Renee, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Renee Stringham. I'm a, well, I'm a mostly retired family physician. I moved to the Oregon coast in 1975 and set up private practice there with my husband and a couple other friends of ours. And that's how I got involved in this. Um, I'm coming to you from the Multnomah tribal lands in Portland. Thanks, Renee. Uh, David, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi. I'm David Tveit, and this is my partner, Dee. And uh, we live in Eugene, Oregon, and uh, we live on the land of the Kalapuya Nation, stretching from the Umpqua River to the south 
and northward to the falls of Oregon City. And we just want to give recognition of that. Um, I first uh, became involved in forest uh, issues and activism in 1973, on my first year of college in Montana. Um, I was from the Midwest. And uh, um, we moved here to Eugene in 86, first Portland, 85. And we quite quickly became involved in anti-pesticide work to, to some degree and uh, kept on hearing stories of rural residents being uh, that inadvertently thought they're moving to paradise and and found themselves being uh, trespassed with chemicals and in searching for for uh, rural land ourselves in Lane County we came became aware of that there are so few places in rural Lane County where you can avoid getting drift uh, of any significance. So um, we've been involved with Community Rights Lane County since about 2013, helped develop the uh, uh, Aerial Herbicide Spray Ban Initiative uh, in 2014 and uh, have been involved with community rights in, in that initiative and another initiative since then. Thanks everybody. Um, some of you may accuse me of not doing my math correct. I said we had six panelists. Uh, we have Susan Swift who's supposed to be joining us and perhaps she will at some point here. So uh, we, will, we will move on in, in hopes that she can be here. It'd be, it'd be really, really great to hear her voice in tonight's event. Uh, with that, though, I want to turn it back to you, Alan, to you mentioned that uh, as part of your introduction, your your journey into into beginning this this process and uh, ten years, of course, is is a very long time to to work on a project like this. And uh, I think it'd be interesting to have people hear about you know going from what you explained in the sense of the images that you saw and and then having that materialize into uh, the film itself, the People versus Agent Orange. You know, what can you let people know about that at that experience, whether the the beginnings of that or just the journey throughout to to get to this point that that you would think people should should understand about that? I'm kind of thinking of uh, myself as a groundhog blinking uh, uh, with the brightness of uh, daylight um, after a long time in a burrow. Um, it's really wonderful to have an event like this because it's almost the first time that we've had the opportunity to encounter our audience in any way. COVID is very much to blame for that. And um, typically film festivals would give us the opportunity to get feedback and hear questions and answer them. Um, and Kai, um, this is really only the second time that we've had uh, that kind of opportunity. So I wanna thank everyone in that respect. Um, we're just really, really deeply gratified uh, at the initiatives and activism that so many of the people there in coastal Oregon took to uh, fight against the aerial spraying of herbicides and to help us um, help them spread the word that it is indeed still going on. Um, just one last uh, very brief uh, comment, an example of the passion and generosity and sense of community that the people of coastal Oregon have brought uh, to responding to this film came to us today when we were told that a guy named Michael Falter, who is the uh, manager um, operating honcho, whatever, of the City Light Cinema um, right there, um, um, is it Lane or Lincoln County? It's that Florence. It's in Florence. In Florence, but I'm not sure which of those two counties it's in. Anyway, he 
announced that all of the proceeds from their ticket sales would be given over to the community rights people. Um, this is a, a theater owner who's um, really financially strapped. He can't um, sell a whole lot of tickets to seats in a theater that's um, unable to bring them in safely. Um, he cares that deeply about the community rights movement that he wants to give back. And people are giving tickets uh, to their friends and their friends are paying them forward by giving others tickets. Yeah, um, and the donations. People have been making donations and the donations help um, defray the cost for others who can't afford a $12 ticket. So that is wonderful. So There's um, uh, discounts or even free tickets for veterans uh, environmentalists, um, students, Seniors, students. <laughs> uh, uh, um, if you log uh, into the film through the screenings tab on the film's website, which has the same title as the film, the people versus agent orange dot com, uh, you'll see a screenings tab and you can go to any of those theaters, many of them in your own communities now uh, and support the community theaters, and in the case of City Lights, um, support the community rights movement itself, because that's where um, their share of the tickets uh, take will go. <laughs> Ellen, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate what you um, just said in the sense of supporting what's going on on the ground. Uh, and I also appreciate your uh, ability to let others shine here. But, but I am curious to see what, what you have to kind of talk about in relation to the work you did to put this film together, because clearly 10 years is, is not a short amount of time. And um, anything that you would like to add just about your observations in the filmmaking process, your experiences, uh, things that you discovered along the way that, that uh, you know, people that are here tonight would, would want to hear. And, um, I, I would appreciate that. I think others would like to as well to, to hear from you about that. I'll probably uh, hand this over to Kate r rather quickly, but um, it began as an investigation. Um, we had no characters. Um, all we knew was that something had gone terribly wrong uh, way back during the Vietnam War years that a lot of people had gotten sick, died, experienced deformed births in their own uh, offspring, uh, and that we should find out uh, how that went within the chemical companies themselves. And that was a fascinating exploration. There had already been two major court cases through discovery in those court cases, many documents of which were hoarded, stored, and made public by Carol Van Strum, one of your most uh, renowned uh, environmental activists. Yes, and you didn't find him. You didn't find her till 2018. Right. 2017. But the documents um, uh, within the chemical companies uh, were revelatory. It showed a level of awareness and conspiracy, uh, avarice to not let the world know that these chemicals they were producing were going to be extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, and uh, the chemical industry was conspiring to keep that danger a secret so that their products uh, would remain on the market and not be uh, prohibited by the government or manufactured by the government. The military was extremely thirsty to use it in Vietnam. Um, and um, they were, from the very beginning, aware of the toxicity 
and committed to keeping it secret. Yeah, it's actually a good uh, segue into maybe hearing from you, Renee, and as a health practitioner, the the real health impacts, you know, acutely, long term wise, and, and even more specifically, the the birth defects from from the exposure to to Agent Orange as as someone in the area at the time. Um, what whatever you can bring to that that uh, specific kind of arena of this, that I think would be very interesting to hear from you about that. Thank you, Kai. I came to the coast in 1975 and to set up a private practice, not at all intending to become an activist. And I delivered an anencephalic child. That's a child that looks like a frog. If you come from the hairline back across the ears, the top of the ears to the spine, there is nothing above that. So the child looks like a frog and they're pretty much incompatible with life. Uh, in my practice, we delivered 150 babies a year. I should never have seen one of these children. There was a second one born in Lincoln County that I was aware of. And there was a third one that was rumored to have been born at home and buried. And then I delivered another child that had a neural tube defect. And you saw some of these children in Vietnam, but in the United States, despite delivering a lot of babies in my training, I had never seen any defects like this. They're very rare, less than one in 100,000. And we're in a county of 18,000 in Lincoln County. So this was pretty dramatic. There was an OR tech who had been part of a group of protesters who'd been sprayed deliberately by uh, one of the timber companies. And he had a lot of symptoms and he got very interested in this and helped form a large group of folks who got together a scientific program. They put it on at Oregon Health Sciences Center Library and they brought experts from all over the country there. And he pushed on me to go. I was busy having babies, setting up a practice, delivering babies. And I really didn't have time to do all this, but it was one of those things where you have to go where you're being called. And so I went to the presentation and that's when I discovered that the neural tube defects and anencephaly were pretty common defects put on by dioxin and also some of the other less well-known um, herbicides. 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T were Agent Orange. And as you saw, if you watched the video, they were produced with a lot of dioxin in them because they were produced in a hurry and dioxin is terribly, terribly toxic. Um, that group of people supported me as I started researching this. And then one of my partners left and he left me with these 10 patients who had been part of the group who were sprayed deliberately as they were protesting. And the acute symptoms they had initially were irritation of the nasal passages, the eyes, cough, and a tremendous amount of neurologic sensitivity. They were anxious where they hadn't been anxious before. They were irritable. And now as I look back at the literature, most of the veterans administration um, diseases that are officially linked to Agent Orange are neurologic diseases or cancers. And so those were the two big groups that, that, I, that got me involved in this. Um, as I learned more and more, I started doing education first for our own medical society and the, our own doctors who were very traditional conservative doctors. 
In fact, one of them had been a flagman on the ground where he stood under where the helicopters were spraying to get their attention. So they sprayed him many times. And he was absolutely certain there were no problems with the Agent Orange. By the time we got finished with all the literature that we could provide him, he, as well as our entire medical society, sponsored an initiative petition. And there was a lot of disinformation and a lot of political uh, maneuvering, lies, all kinds of things that happened. And I guess I can expand on it later, but it wasn't until after the initiative petition failed, but the education continued and I went up and down the coast to other medical societies, educating the doctors. And all of a sudden there was a two page spread in the LA Times. And then there was an article in the New York Times. And then there was an article in Sports Illustrated about what was going on in Lincoln County. And that's when I had two fellows show up at my door on a Saturday morning while my husband was making rounds at the hospital and my kids were running around and playing. And I sort of assumed they were reporters because they were in suits and nobody else came to the door in Lincoln County in suits. And uh, so I was talking to them, gave them a cup of coffee and they asked, you know, they wanted to talk about the herbicides. And after about a half an hour, I could tell that they were really from the other side. And then one of them asked me if I'd ever seen the movie uh, I think it's called Silkwood, about Karen Silkwood and the nuclear things and how she, with all her papers, disappeared on the way to a large hearing. And I said, yes. And I stood up and I said, I think it's time for you to leave. And then they asked me the question, do you always know where your children are? Can you be certain where your children are all the time? And this was not too long after Carol's children had died in that fire. And at that point, I packed up everything, five file drawers full of papers and took them to the Northwest Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides in Eugene. And I told people, I said, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. Anyway, that's a very short synopsis of part of my story. So. Thanks for asking, Kai, and thank you all for continuing this very, very important fight. Thank you, Renee. I'm sure there'll be other questions um, about your experiences there, what you saw uh, from, from people that are, are viewing here tonight, but thank you for sharing that. Um, you, you mentioned Carol, and I wanna turn maybe to Kate. Um, when Alan was talking and, and you had, you mentioned that uh, the Poison Papers and, and Carol, as far as your film project, wasn't something that was there from, let's say, the beginning or even early on, but came very much towards the end of, of putting the film together. Um, when you discovered Carol and, and the work she had been doing and what she'd been connected to and all that she had gone through, you know, what did it take for you as filmmakers to, to figure out how to, to, to share her story and tell her story and, and really, I guess, blend that into the work that you've been doing on um, really featuring what had been happening in Vietnam and you yes. know, during the era of the war, as well as you know, currently that goes on. You know, what, what did that take in the sense of, of really, I guess, doing as, as good of justice as you can to, to what Carol had gone through as, a, as an activist and a mother? and um, yeah, uh, please. Um, we were deep into the film when we found Carol. We were working with Madame Tron in Vietnam, and we had also found another character named uh, Admiral Zumwalt, who was responsible for even bringing Agent Orange to be used by the Navy. He was commander of the Naval Forces in Vietnam. And his own son, who was working with him, who was a commander of the Swift Boats, was exposed to Agent Orange and subsequently died shortly after the war. So we had him as another character. And when we found Carol, it was there was a there was we had to really balance we had to balance her story with 
Madame Trons and possibly leave, lose other characters. And, and then it became about these two women. So the, the, the process of the film morphed over several years. It, because we didn't even know there was anything going on in Oregon until we found Carol. We didn't have any clue until we saw this article about the poison papers and what she was doing. And that was eye-opening and news-breaking for us. So that was a decision that we really wanted to bring home to an American audience. We also had a um, co-production going on with Arte in France and Germany, and then CPB, I mean, PBS and ITBS in the United States. And so bringing in that American audience was also a very good, uh, it was, it helped us make that decision of, all right, let's focus on two women, two women struggling against this situation and how do they cope and bring it home to America and in France at the same time. There's a little bit of a lesson I could add to that. Um, the folks who were already behind the film were extremely cautionary when we uh, discovered Carol, uh, learned about uh, the continuing struggle against aerial spraying of toxic herbicides uh, there in coastal Oregon. Um, but those folks were afraid that we were going to lose our focus, uh, <laughs> dilute the impact of the film and it was a struggle. It, it was, we had to really believe in our own instincts and our own storytelling instincts were that this was going to balance the Vietnam and American uh, sagas and catastrophes. Uh, and Carol turned out to be an extraordinarily articulate, dramatic, likable, knowledgeable woman who had written this spectacular book, A Bitter Fog, which chronicled the experiences of so many of the people there in coastal Oregon who um, suffered problems as a result of the spraying. So we had to kind of let that initial resistance, run off our backs, stick to our guns, call it whatever you will, well, metaphorically. Really try to come up with a structure. And then Renee, Dr. Stringham, was a great asset to the film because she made it very clear what the medical repercussions of the spraying were, what was going on here, because the same kind of thing was going on in Vietnam. That was important. And Renee made clear the degree of suppression and threat that was going on and filled in a lot of resonance, um, which as she uh, alluded to, related to uh, the tragic uh, death by burning of Carol's children. Um, so, it was a major yeah. linchpin. All of that pushback, all of that conflict, I think helped with the structure of the film. It helped show what was going on, I think. You wanna, could ask your viewers. You wanna talk about the other discovery? Helicopter Man? Oh yes, and then I, I, we were doing all of these, it took years to raise money for the film. And before we had ITBS and before we had Arte, we were presenting in front of 350 broadcasters in Amsterdam. We had to show three minute pitch and all at the time, all we had was Madame Tron, Trontonia. And uh, they said, is this, this is a history film. This is too much of a history film. Um, is it going to be any, are you going to make it contemporary? <laughs> and we lied and said, well, yes, of course, it's, you know, history, but it, you know, we're going to make this. She's suing all of these people in France. And so when we came back, I immediately got online and started looking for someone who was working in the industry. And we found Daryl Ivey, who had sent all of these clips of what he shot with his little camera into the Oregonian newspaper. And I said, Alan, you got to find this guy. You got to get him. 
<laughs> and um, he did. It took a couple of weeks to get around and find where he was. And, and he just sent us all of his material immediately. And it was eye-opening, eye-opening material. So you could see what the women were saying anecdotally was affecting their children. You could see him get sprayed, get sick, cough, coughing up blood. So you, you start to see in real time someone getting sick from the experience of being sprayed because everybody else was just talking about it. It was so weird that he seemed to know that these scenes that he was narrating on his cell phone would reach a broad audience. Uh, it mystifies me to this yeah. day. Who was he talking How he to? could have had that. <laughs> I would have said how he had that illusion. Right. He kept saying, look at this. Look at this. I want to show you something. And I don't know who he's talking to. It's not his girlfriend. Or, he's talking. He's making a, a he's making he's making a reportage. He was a whistleblower. I want to just show you. Look over there. We're spraying and it's going into the watershed over there. He's talking to you. And he says, I got to take the camera down. The honcho over there is going <laughs> to get me in trouble. He gets sprayed himself. He's this wise guy in the beginning, making these sort of self-conscious um, uh, remarks like, we're going to go up the top of the mountain and toxify things. Um, sense of irony and almost self-conscious but lighthearted uh, ridicule. Uh, the way he says toxify as if he's um, mimicking uh, the uh, right. resistance to aerial spraying. Um, and he does actually attend a, a, a meeting in which people are discussing stopping the spraying. And he, his narrative gets more and more uh, expository and more and more uh, whistleblowing-like until he's uh, telling us, I'm standing outside the decontamination shower at the hospital. They're treating me like a biological hazard. And he's coughing up blood and his skin is breaking out. And we're seeing it all. Uh, and he's filming it and narrating it. it uh, to this day, I, I just marvel that that happened. Yeah, it's almost like a, a bizarre reality TV show in a different dimension. Uh, yes, well <laughs> said, <Kai. laughs> um, I wanted to, to kind of link together all that we've been discussing here in the sense of, of, of ultimately what it takes to, to call this out and, you know, to push back despite the, the real consequences um, as Renee described in her own experiences, you know, when you try to, to bring power to truth, what, what happens when uh, the system doesn't take kindly to that? Uh, we had um, Susan Swift was going to be here tonight to talk about her experiences as, as part of that, that earlier legacy of, of activism work, you know, joining with people like uh, Carol Von Strom, um, but we do have uh, Deb there in, in Lincoln County. And Deb, I wanted to, to hear from you about what it's been like to kind of, you know, stand on the shoulders of, of, of others from the past there, knowing that you're uh, unfortunately fighting in a lot of way the same fight, um, that the, the legacy of, of seeing what's happening as, as an economic good and protecting it as, you know, the law says it's fine, uh, and here we are still today uh, dealing with very similar realities that that um, the film describes as coming out of the Vietnam era. Um, and, you know, you were part of an effort where where people banded together to, to say no to aerial spray, you know, through the through a ballot initiative vote uh, there in 2017. And, you know, if you can just share some of your your thoughts or experiences as you went through that, or as you thought back to that period, and you know, putting it in relation to the film and all, um, yeah, please please take some time to do that. Wow, you just gave me this great big thing, and 
um, find the thread again. Um, yeah, I, I've, I have been amazed and honored that we have the, the I'll call you the pioneers, Renee. <laughs> You were the you were the first round of the pushback and the and the digging for data and for understanding what these things were about, and I think the dioxin laced Agent Orange left no no question about the harms that it was doing. Um, I mean, industry was was stealing frozen cadavers of of birds and and other animals that were in people's freezers. And Susan had done a major investigation of health issues with the people that lived in their valley of five rivers. And all of her stuff was stolen from her home. Um, you know, her results of what people's health histories showed. Um, so having, having these remarkable people here to tell us what they had learned, how they had done what they were doing, was really useful and mentored us a lot um, during the process of campaigning. Um, our group was all new to that kind of activity and we did our best and we, we won and we were surprised that we won. <laughs> um, we were very pleased that we won. Um, but I think we underestimated <laughs> What, what our county went through that first time. I remember when we were doing phone contacts with, with the public late in our campaign, and I, I started to get antsy about calling some of the areas that I see as more of a, a conservative um, timber industry, families living in this area of the county, and wondering you know what kind of a reception am I gonna get when I tell them why I'm calling. And what surprised me was that the people that I talked to remembered what happened before. They were part of those early times of being sprayed and they were not for it either. And there was actually some public relations testing done in, in Lincoln County late in the campaign. And what, what they reported was that even people who were part of timber industries and mill activity said, no, we don't want aerial spraying. So I, I think I would have given anything to see the faces of our opposition when they read that results. Um, it was very clear that the people here had been harmed and they knew it and they didn't appreciate it and they don't believe the spin messages about this is not toxic, this is safe if you follow the, the instructions on the labels. Um, <laughs> I think having, having 29 months of our law being in place was a, was a real precious time that there was a lot of attention paid to what happened here in our county. And I think the, the big, moneyed interests were very surprised that we were able to pull this off. Um, but during that time, our timber industry people, if they sprayed, did it by a hand application, which doesn't use nearly the amount of chemical as, as the aerial spraying puts out on the land. And I, I, fantasize that I was listening to my forest that surrounds where I live and that they were having a relief that they were they were feeling somehow recognized as, as having value other than becoming timber. Um, so it you know it it showed us as activists that yes they can they can practice timber or, or tree farming um, without doing that activity. So there was a lot of, of good stuff that came out in that, that interim time. Um, and I think we empowered other people to understand that, yes, this can happen. We can do this. So that was gratifying. And I'll, I'll never forget having a conversation with a, a, a new friend of ours um, in Douglas County 
when he heard the story of, you know, we had, we had passed our vote, he actually burst into tears and said, I have been working on this my whole adult life. And I'm so pleased that somebody did it. So I, I thank Susan and I thank Renee and I thank Carol for the, the inspirations and for the information and the assistance that they continue to give to those of us that are on the ground. Thanks, Deb. Um, David, as, as someone that's been doing this work in, in the community rights frame to what Deb just brought up in the sense of confronting what you're told not to confront in the way that they did there in Lincoln County, like you have been attempting to do there in Lane County, you know, with so much corporatization of, of timber as it's, it's come to bear and uh, not just the economic power and the political power, but, but clearly the, the legal apparatus that shields them um, and uh, pretty much allows them to do what they, what they choose to do despite the opposition, despite the information, you know, despite a film like The People versus Agent Orange, despite the poison papers, despite, you know, mountains of evidence that you could supply either scientifically or observationally, you know, what have you seen or what do you see in the sense of what community rights has been able to do to, to really kind of confront that reality in the name of people, community and the environment? You know, what's, what's been your experience there that you could share with others here tonight? Yeah, I think uh, we have made significant headway in getting way more public awareness of the issue. So many people in Lane County uh, are more urban and are not aware of it. And uh, when we collected signatures for our um, freedom from aerial herbicide ban, we would run into just lots of people who thought it was ended back in the 80s. And that was when the federal lands, uh, it ended on federal lands, but they had no idea it was continuing on private lands state forest lands and, and any private lands. And uh, I, I wanna make a brief aside um, related to back in the 70s and 80s with the, in the Oregon Coast Range, um, just about a mile, mile and a half from here, we have a fruit stand and I was uh, asking to put up a poster for an event that Community Rice was doing. And the woman got, pretty emotional who was there and told me that she she used to live in the coast range and she gave birth to a, a deformed child that died. And she also was threatened in having people, having cars follow her and track her. And um, so it, it just, uh, she experienced that. And, uh, you know, she's living in, in the metro area now, but um, most people just haven't heard about that. Um, so getting back to, to uh, changes, um, we've gotten a fair amount of media attention for, for our efforts, but it's been a struggle to keep it in the news. And uh, we have run into endless roadblocks. Part of the context for that is Lane County and Douglas County, just south of us, are the two biggest timber producing counties in the entire United States. We are timber central for the US and, and the history of Oregon, uh, Western Oregon is, um, the timber has really ruled. Timber is like coal to West Virginia or mining to Nevada. And uh, the politicians have been really co-opted and so forth. So. We, we are really up against uh, a lot of uh, entrenched opposition. And uh, with Lane, they, by the time Lincoln County was a little bit ahead of us and it, it seems pretty apparent uh, the uh, timber interests and the politicians who support them strategize to block us at every turn. Um, we still haven't, been thoroughly blocked, but it's been a, a difficult road. Thanks, David. Thank you, uh, panelists, for sharing what you have so far. Uh, I 
think we're at a point if, if everyone's okay that we'll we'll shift to questions that have been uh, coming in through chat. I've have a couple people kind of sorting through it for me. And so I'm just gonna start through the questions that I've gotten so far. And as I mentioned at the front end, we'll get through as many as we can before the uh, we hit our, our end time at, at 7.30. Uh, this first question um, is asking, uh, about the possibility of a case of assault or something else being brought against the industry for deliberately spraying the people. Uh, and then they follow by saying, or am I being naive? Um, I don't know um, who may want to tackle this, but perhaps in relation to, to trans fight now legally, if, if, you know, Alan or Kate, whomever has been tracking that closely to maybe see how that could answer the, the question or, or get to what the, the viewer is asking here about that. Well, actually, I can add a little to that because one of my patients, uh, Norma McMillan, who later became our county commissioner, one of our county commissioners, woke one morning to hear the helicopter spraying out over her garden and her farm. And she ran out in her nightgown out into her garden and the fumes were overwhelming and she fell down the helicopter saw her, came back and made a second pass and drenched her with herbicide. She was in the intensive care unit for three days and she took that to court. And I went and testified as did many other people and she won in court. And the judge gave her, awarded her $1 in damages. She lost her farm, she lost her home, she lost everything paying the legal bills. So bringing an assault suit is possible, but you've got to have really deep pockets. Thanks, Renee. Uh, Kate or, or Alan or any, anybody else want to talk about the, the current lawsuit that, that Tran has brought and sort of the, the same idea here around the, you know, the larger collective assault versus the individual of which was Renee just has described, but anything that you want to bring into the conversation here tonight about that? I say that it's a very interesting contrast between uh, the struggle for community environmental rights and individuals who've been personally uh, damaged. Um, Renee's story is an example of the herbicides being used as a weapon, um, which of course, um, was the case in Vietnam and uh, remained um, sort of the prototype that um, these helicopter jockeys uh, are obviously very well aware of. It seems that our uh, cell phone guy uh, is uh, even deliberately sprayed while he's filming and he uh, speculates that the pilot did it um, because um, the pilot was aware that he was recording and filming uh, what would blow the whistle on the whole operation. There is a very, very significant movement uh, going on in the world today to codify ecocide as a crime against humanity ecocide being a very broadly based attack on the environment and its inhabitants. Um, it's a term that was coined um, back in the Vietnam War years and um, has been knocked around a good bit. Uh, and finally, uh, in recognition of this crime against humanity and against the environment, um, the International Criminal Court is considering adopting a law that would make it possible to prosecute those who perpetrate ecocide. And one of the first examples that they're focusing on is the burning of the rainforest in Brazil. Uh, and Bolsonaro, the prime minister or president, president of, of Brazil, Brazil um, uh, being held up as uh, the deliberate perpetrator and um, the uh, singular figure uh, 
uh, who is uh, bringing about this assault on, on humanity and on the environment. Um, Madam Trons awaiting the conclusion after seven years of um, legal rigmarole, hearings, procedural disputes. Finally, uh, on May 10th, uh, the court in France where she brought this case against virtually the entire American chemical industry will finally conclude. If she wins, uh, it will be uh, news that will be trumpeted around the world already on uh, April 20. Jan January 25th, they were all there. The global media was all there. Um, her final pleadings in the case brought out global media already. We were uh, astonished. We were afraid we were the only ones who knew or care about Madame Tron's case. And it turns out the whole world is waiting to hear what, uh, how that will conclude. Um, so the world is waking up to this, um, to the dangers of the aerial spraying, to the cover up of the toxicity, um, to the range of uh, products that um, are conventionally used around the world, such as Roundup, which many have found to be extraordinarily damaging to our own physiology and to the pollinators, um, butterflies, bees, birds. Um, it's killing off nature in general. And if we don't get control of that, we're going to live in a very, very barren world. But we should also add that uh, in the case of Tron, uh, her lawyers are working pro bono, wow. so which is extraordinary. So everything she does to try to raise money, she's giving them. But she doesn't. She believes that they should be making some kind of money during all this time, but it would never cover the costs of what's going on. But it, they are working pro bono. Wow. Deb, did you want to add something quickly there? Yeah, I wanted to comment about whether or not people can sue for damages um, against being sprayed. The, the process that's in place through the law is codified so that you notify Department of Agriculture. And I think anybody who's been around a while knows that regulatory agencies in the federal government have, <laughs> are, are, are vulnerable to industry with power manipulating whether they get funded and what their budgets are for any given time. So they have a real leverage about, you know, they, they may come and explore what has been re reported about an overspray or drifting, that kind of thing. And they will, they will test for evidence of that. But I think, it's, there were two cases in Curry County where they had flat out direct aerial spraying and nothing came about because of that. Um, they took it to court twice and they lost both times. So basically the law says you, you can't sue the, this company. <laughs> they have impunity to do what they do. That's a, I'd like to add that uh, um, the way the law is written, it makes it extremely difficult. The burden of proof is extremely high. And the person who's uh, bringing the lawsuit, they will have to pay tim the timber industry's court costs if they lose. So it, 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 it makes it, you know, like really near impossible and, and it's very risky to even try. Um, that sets up well another question that came in as well as to what Alan finished off and talking about sort of what are we going to be left with, you know, planetarily and human systems wise. Uh, there's kind of a multi part question here that one of the viewers submitted and I'll read it and any one of you can jump in. 
uh, they write there, how do the pressures of the growth imperative, which is the central tenet of capitalism, make eliminating or even regulating dangerous chemicals like Agent Orange difficult, if not impossible? And then tied to that, from the Timberman's point of view, there is an infinite global demand for Douglas fir fiber, and the best way to grow Douglas fir is to kill everything that isn't a Douglas fir. Is it possible to simultaneously defend capitalism and seriously push for meaningful conservation and significant limitations on herbicides and pesticides on our forest lands? So if you're able to track that, uh, that's the question. I don't know who wants to to jump in and, and clearly if any one of these questions, we can spend a long time trying to answer them, but curious to know if any of you have a, have a response to that. Yeah, I'd like to um, at least respond to part of it. It's a very loaded, uh, broad question and, and topic. Uh, one of the things with the way the our US economy is structured and the incentives uh, are um, plus the free to grow law in Oregon that encourages uh, fast regrowth of Douglas fir plantations is a lot of the industrial forest land is, is publicly traded and there is this whole encouragement to maximize profits for shareholders. And that is a significant push for very short rotations which is a part of, it ties into why they all the more use aerial herbicides because they can crank out the fastest rotations and profits, at least in the short term. You know, as far as capitalism goes, I think, you, you know, you could, you could put changes in those laws related to Wall Street and so forth that would rein it in. You could require longer rotations and past 60 years um, there isn't much of any financial incentive to use aerial herbicides. But uh, uh, sustainability still is in question with the whole way I think we're approaching forests. And we, I think there needs to be a dramatic change in how we deal with our forests and, and approach them so that they can be sustainable and also sequester carbon, which is another really huge issue that we're facing on planet Earth. Any of the other panelists want to, to add to what David laid out here? When we were doing the initiative petition, we had two foresters that were working with us and there were two things that they came up with, one of, one of which helped the, the government to stop spraying the national forests. Um, the contract at that time was that for every acre they sprayed, they could overcut the national forest elsewhere by 10 acres. And it cost them $80 to spray one acre, and then they could overcut the, re the rest of it. And the foresters showed that actually spraying changed the number of board feet by decreasing the number of board feet you got out of that forest. And they showed that over and over and the industry went after those foresters, one of whom worked for the National Forest. And he managed a huge acreage down south by uh, south of Coos Bay actually. And he showed over 20 years without using herbicides that he got more board feet so this is an industry perpetuated lie that they're going to get more and a, a, a faster turnover. I, I don't know what's been done research wise since and I wish there was a forester here to talk about that because it was a big part of, of the underpinning of why, why they were spraying the national forest at that point because they could do that overcut. And I'm not sure that there isn't some good data if somebody dug for it to show what that fellow down south of Coos Bay showed over 20 years with his, the area of the national forest he managed without herbicides. So I think it can be done, but there's such a tremendous pressure by the chemical companies and the timber companies I actually met with the Secretary of Agriculture from France 
about, mm, gosh, must, you know, when you're 80, time passes in odd ways, but it was a long time ago. And she had just come from a week with Monsanto and she wanted to go back to France and raise GMO crops, hmm. sell in the United States. Now it's illegal to raise them or to sell them in France, but she thought that she could get the gov French government to allow her to raise those so she could sell them in the United States. And Monsanto had actually convinced her that this stuff was not harmful. And I was just, I was blown away that they're just doing this everywhere. It's not just here. And we have to really be aware of the power of those companies and their tactics. Yeah, that, that actually sets up a, a, a question back to you, Renee, um, both in the, in the film as, as well as when you spoke earlier, you, you talked about the, the tremendous pressure and threat to, to you and your family and your, your choices or your choice to, to basically leave. Do you, as, as time has passed and, and clearly that, that has not left you, but the, the, the viewer asked if you have any regrets about making that decision uh, or not? I guess I don't have any regrets. I wish it had been different. And I wish there had been a way for me to continue. But we in Lincoln County, and it wasn't just me, I mean, our entire medical society and the medical societies up and down the coast were beginning to move on this. The March of Dimes offered Sam Epstein a million dollars back then, which was a lot of money. And he came and asked, would I be the head investigator looking at miscarriages in our area? And I just couldn't do it. I was stretched too thin. And everybody was interested in putting money into this and expanding the knowledge base. And that was a huge threat to the industries. And I personified that threat because I was the one that had done the research and was doing all the education. I, you know, I wish I could have said, yes, I was strong and, you know, I could risk my kids' lives, but I knew I couldn't. It just, it wasn't possible. Um, as a mother, I, I couldn't do it. Alan, there, a question came in about, um, the gentleman who who filmed himself being sprayed and and the how where that all led to and the, the questions were you know do you know what happened to him uh, is he well is he involved in efforts to try to stop spraying what what do you know about him today beyond what you you showed in the film it's interesting that um, that question keeps coming up people are obviously engaged in Daryl Ivy's identity and um in fact he's doing really well um he he was very sick after those 17 days uh he spent um servicing uh that helicopter with herbicides uh it took uh, many months for him to get his health back to be able to breathe well for the skin condition to go away, um, but it's left him something of a health fanatic. Uh, he's in the gym three times a week. He's built like the proverbial brick, you know what house. Um, uh, and he wants to help people learn how to live free of herbicides. He's thinking of writing a book. He wants to tell people how to eat well uh, and how to stay safe. He's an incredibly uh, courageous guy. He's very proud and satisfied that his videos are getting an audience. And um, he cautioned us, um, just don't make it look like I'm a victim. Um, I uh, care about my health and I protect myself and uh, whatever mistakes I may have fallen into before, believe me, I'm a lot smarter now. That's great. Um, 
there've been a couple of questions uh, related to the effort to ban aerial spray. The more uh, in 2017, and for those that have been tracking it, you know, the the timber interest, basically chemical interest, came and uh, and sued the county to overturn the laws. As Deb mentioned, the the law stayed on the books for over two years. Uh, the lower court uh, heard the case between upholding the law versus overturning it. Uh, when she did make her her ruling or as she do her opinion, she she basically sided with uh, the timber companies in the sense that that communities don't have that authority to to protect themselves. Basically, is is the shorthand that that the structures of law through state preemption prevail. Um, Lincoln County has contested that in a, in a court of appeals, um, expecting a hearing uh, probably sometime this spring, but. A couple of questions have come in from viewers about running in another initiative, uh, whether directly about aerial spray or something in regards to the fact that aerial spraying continues and you know what would that look like? And just to expand upon that, one person wrote here related to what happened recently in the sense of a large number of, of environmental organizations there in Oregon coming together to sign this memorandum of understanding with timber companies, you know, not to pursue something like an aerial spray ban. Um, having that be the case, you know, what are people left with in contesting things like aerial spray? You know, what would it look like to run another effort either there in Lincoln County or elsewhere? You know, I guess what 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 is your suggestion or advice or or views of things, Deb and and, and David, around the fact that aerial spraying continues? Uh, there isn't much movement that I can see and that I think that you're seeing really at the state level or otherwise to, to stop it. So what are communities left with, I suppose, in, in protecting themselves in the way that the, the film features and the way that we've been discussing tonight? A couple things. We have, we have written another initiative, and it is about protection of, of watersheds. Um, and then COVID hit. <laughs> And that isn't a, a good relationship for being able to collect signatures or to get out and talk to people. Um, so that has kind of been sitting, sitting, waiting until we know when we might do something differently. And in the interim, what what we've the discussions we've had are, you know, if we continue to do these initiatives that take a, a good amount of effort and some cost and manpower to make them go and a, probably a year or two in the process, is that the most efficient way that we can work? Um, and looking at how do we go to the, the heart of the matter, which is the legal system in our legislative um, ORSs where there are protections written in for industry and what what community rights is is working with is talking about local law, local lawmaking and local decisions um, to raise the the level of health and safety for the people, and that is a constitutional right. Um, but we're talking about changing, making an amendment to the constitution that actually codifies into law that we have the right to do that. That we we would like for our legislature to put that ballot on, or to put that, that question before the people um, on a ballot measure. And so that, you know, the legislature doesn't have to agree with what we're saying. They don't have to appreciate that this is a reasonable request. Um, all they need to do is agree to put it on the ballot so that the people of Oregon can vote on it. And so the efforts of, of community rights statewide is going towards that effort at this time. And I don't know if you want to say more about that, Kai or David, or um, I'd be glad to share. Yeah, we could drop in the chat a link to the Oregon Community Rights Network's uh, website about that if people aren't tracking and want to know more. Um, and I know that in Carol's book, she speaks to uh, obviously is a longtime activist against uh, specifically, you know, herbicides and pesticides, you know, she's clearly of the understanding that there's deeper structural change needed in how government functions and who has power. And so 
uh, what you just described, Dev, is, is really getting to the heart of it, that there are so many things outside of just what we've been talking about, uh, which we have been systemically denied the ability to protect ourselves, and uh, clearly people want to change that. Uh, David, do you have anything else you want to add just to the question of, of really the advocacy that's happening in Oregon or could happen in Oregon? I, I know there's efforts um, clearly as, as Deb defined there that are trying to, to see the light of day in, in Lincoln County. You've, you've had your own uh, attempts and issues there in Lane County. I know there's interest in, in Douglas County and elsewhere, but um, it's going to take a lot of places and a lot of efforts uh, to push against a well-built structure. So I don't know if you have any input or advice or observations you want to add into that. Yeah, I think it's, first of all, I think it's important for people to understand. I don't know that it's been explicitly stated that the Oregon State Legislature preempts local communities from protecting their health, safety, and welfare in enacting laws, which Lincoln County and Lane County both put forth initiatives ours is the chart amendment um, that uh, we're basically claiming that we have the local right. And that that is a part of why they were struck down or held up because we are challenging state law. And the state has uh, been a, you know, basically the state's laws uh, are, over, are over anything local. And uh, we firmly believe that local communities have the right to protect their health, safety, and welfare. And uh, the state um, amendment that uh, Deb brought up that we want to put before the before the voters would would basically get rid of preemption and allow local control for protecting health, safety, and welfare. And uh, Another option that isn't as much of a community rights approach and has been talked about quite a bit is to have a statewide initiative directly on aerial herbicides and banning them, maybe all pesticides even. Um, and there is some interest in that. Uh, several of the groups that, that there's 13 different enviro groups that signed on to the Memorandum of Understanding in Senate Bill 1602 which basically hobbled them from taking on anything related to uh, limiting aerial herbicides until 2027. And it seemed like it was very much a stalling tactic by the timber industry. Um, so, but the, the MOU has to be decided, uh, worked out within, uh, I think it's about 12 more months now and it likely will fall apart. And then those enviro groups are open to challenging the uh, herbicide spraying again. Um, so it's kind of up in the air, but it, it, long story short, we support the local communities having that right to have higher standards than the state. Um, I'm gonna shift to a little different direction here and a question that came to me directly. Uh, Someone had asked Alan and, and Kate what advice you might have for aspiring filmmakers, uh, since it's the film that brought us here tonight uh, in the sense of getting funding, how do you get people's attention in a world that seems flooded by social media and it's competing for our limited attention. So what, what could you, can you say in the realm of just the craft of and the art of, of filmmaking and someone trying to get into that world based on, you know, the funding difficulties and, and just, being bombarded by other forms of, of media that, that um, you know, maybe don't keep us from actually delving into to important topics like your, your film has provided here? I think it's very, very helpful to believe uh, in the cause that your film may be advancing because during the hard lean times that can extend uh, for many months or years, if you don't really have a strong sense of mission, you may not be able to persevere uh, enough to actually bring your film through to completion. Um, I have a friend who made a film about an artist uh, and 
it's been a very, very difficult sell for her. Um, nobody particularly wants to fund it. Um, there's no way that it's going to really produce um, much of an audience that would pay for it. And it's not giving her um, the social gratification of doing good. On the other hand, um, the essentials of storytelling um, are probably just as important uh, as um, having that sense of conviction in the cause that you may be uh, promoting through a film. Uh, and if you don't have strong characters, and if you don't have a strong story behind them, it's going to be very, very difficult to engage people's at attention. Um, constantly in our uh, filmmaking, um, in the isolation of the editing room, we would debate over and over again how certain scenes would play on people's consciousness. Um, would they understand this? Are we losing them if we change from Vietnam to Oregon, um, will that de derail their attention? Um, and we'd bring people into the editing room and find, yes, indeed, we were uh, really in a, a, a difficult spot and the edit wasn't holding up and people were getting lost. And as Kate said earlier, we had to lose characters or, or reorder. Um, I have to shout Kate out for her perseverance because I'm um, much more easily satisfied um, that we've uh, gotten the facts out there and the artistry and um, uh, the shaping of story uh, is something that Kate as a film editor is extremely perseverant about. and. Um, that perseverance is a characteristic that I think every filmmaker needs to have in order to complete any work whatsoever. I think it also helps people who have a vision, who have an idea, they want to make a film, to find someone else who shares that vision, a friend, a producer, another, someone who you could bounce ideas off of. It's very, very helpful to have that kind of support. And also to um, think about who your audience is. Who would you like to address your film to? That's very helpful, helps you focus. And it also helps you determine, well, should I do this in three minutes, in five minutes, in 10 minutes, in 15, make a short, rather than a whole big you know, 90 minute, which takes a lot of effort, a lot of time and a lot of money to make, but you can get it. You can get incredible things across in just a few minutes. Um, so that exercise of finding your audience finds, helps you find your vision in a certain way and sort of focus it. I hope that helps. Yeah, and it, and it looks like you guys still like each other too after all of that. So. <laughs> um, Mom and pop productions. <clears throat> no, I had to bring other people into the edit room. No, you definitely need, I often needed other people in the edit room to get, to be able to, to try things out because you, you always need more pairs of eyes. You need other people's reactions to what you do. It's very, very helpful. Other, Cause you're constantly, I feel like I'm like working in a closet and that I need to be able to push things out there and test it on people all the time. We have a third producer, Veronique Bernard. Um, she was so helpful. Uh, she came aboard after a few years and um, a couple of times um, said, really my main role is to uh, arbitrate between the two of you <laughs> and help you guys to figure out um, what you're gonna do uh, when you both see it in opposite terms. And it's true, that was um, very, very helpful for us. Um, you know what's really cool, though, for filmmakers starting now? 
I'm seeing little kids making films. The fact that you have a phone that shoots in high definition and gives you pretty damn good sound means that you already have a tool in your hand to go out and make something. And with the internet and all the different platforms, you don't need the kind of like budgets and things that you need for broadcast. You can already start making something. In fact, there was a film that showed at Sundance, I believe it was totally made on a phone. And mm. I don't ask me the name of the film, I wasn't there, but uh, it was very successful. The entire film was shot on an iPhone. So it's, it's a new world out there. It's, it's like open, anybody can get in there and do their thing. I think it's very exciting. Well, thank you for that. Um, there was already a, a request for part two of tonight and uh, maybe we can regather after Madam Tran wins her case. <laughs> Let's do it. Pop some Let's champagne and, and talk about the, the next wave of, of efforts needed. Um, we are at, at close. Uh, very big, heartfelt thank you to all the panelists for being here tonight and, and sharing um, not only the, the mechanics, um, but some very, very deep, um, you know, personal realities of what the, the film has brought out and what it means. And um, so I, I'm highly appreciative and I hope everyone else is. And I, I think the, the thank yous have gotten through chat quite a bit uh, saying so. Um, for those who haven't seen the film or want others to see it, uh, The People versus Agent Orange is, is, is what you can put in your search bar or someone will drop into the chat. Um, there are currently film screenings going on uh, but to kind of track other possibilities of, of where to see it and when to see it, you know, please go to the website there. Uh, for community rights interests, there's a, a lot going on coming up. Um, you can connect through the Oregon Community Rights Network or any one of the, the local chapters that were uh, helping or helped put this event on. I know that Lane County, for instance, has a public community rights action meeting, they call it, uh, happening this coming Monday. So you can go to the CRLC website. Um, uh, some of my assistants will drop that in the chat if you need it. Um, there is a, a, a info session next Thursday on the constitutional amendment that was mentioned a few times. Um, if you haven't uh, kind of gotten a wind of that, go to the, the Oregon Community Rights Network website or Facebook page. Uh, the Community Environmental League Defense Fund has a series coming up in April around Earth Day, kind of talking about where we sit in the broader environmental reality. So beyond just pesticides and herbicides, uh, that'd be well worth attending. Uh, and then the last plug for something coming up uh, uh, community rights wise in April, uh, the CELDEF and the ORCRN is hosting a panel of indigenous people to talk about uh, environmental justice or really injustice towards the tribes uh, and really the, the work happening with tribal nations in regards to rights of nature. Uh, so we talked about law, how we can push really the legal world to see nature as a, a living entity and not treat it as, uh, as property and, and abuse it in the way that we've been doing. So uh, clearly a lot of what transpired uh, in the making of the film, you know, speaks to this idea that our, our legal system has it upside down in the way that it sees the natural world. Uh, so lots to do, lots to track. Um, of course, in our Zoom world, lots of Zooms to attend. Um, but just to say in closing, thank you very much again, everyone for being here to all our panelists, uh, Alan and Kate, great to finally meet you, uh, Renee, for, for all that you've been through and all that you've experienced being here tonight, Deb and David, uh, for all your hard work. And of course, all the other people, uh, trying to make a better, just equitable world, you know, don't give up, keep at it. Thank you very much, everybody.